Let's get across that Red Sea. So last we left, <laughs> is there a song? <laughs> There's a few of them. Last we left Israel waiting at Pihar Hiroth, trapped. And uh, God's just making them wait there till Pharaoh repents of his repentance. And that, of course, is the point at which God destroys a wicked man. When he finally does repent, but then reneges of that repentance. Now, you've got to wonder what's going through Pharaoh's mind. He forgot the plagues. He forgot to bury his dead son. Seventy days was the normal time period for an important royal for the period of mourning. And uh, all this happened within that 70 days. And he asked his officials, we're in Exodus 14, why have we done this? So verse 5, it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. There's that. It's all about matters of the heart and matters of the imagination with sinners, including us. Uh, the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people and they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? I don't know, ten plagues, death of the firstborn. Might have been some good reasons, but anyway. And this just demonstrates the connection between deliberate wickedness, satanic madness and looming death. There's a massive call-up of the Egyptian military and they hastily uh, pulled them all together and then that force which was the army which had destroyed the Hyksos only eight years earlier and uh, gone right up into Syria along the coastal plain. Uh, that's 1533 BC. They thunder down the desert highway towards the Israelite camp. And the Israelites are well and truly trapped. What does it say? Uh, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is verse 8. And he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped by the sea besides Pihar Hiroth before Baal Zephon. So, something's going to happen. The Israelites had been in camp just long enough for the emotional high of the Passover night to wear off. Ever had that? Had a great time at a conference or something and uh, then you get a couple of weeks down the road and where's that feeling again? Must be hard being a charismatic. And now the fear that resides in the schemings of the flesh gripped them with panic. This is when you fear, when you're trying to figure it out. You're scheming away. And uh, guess what? You're not smart enough. And then you're afraid. Wild-eyed, they turned on Moses and accused him of destroying them. This was their favourite line, actually. They're always attacking Moses with this. Uh, this is Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew, drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. At least they cried to the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us, dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Well, Moses must have already been given his marching orders by this point, because what does he do? Verse 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. So Moses is putting on a brave face to the Israelites, which was good, but secretly, maybe internally, he's praying to the Lord, and the Lord says, I've already told you what to do. Get on with it. The Lord rebuked him for praying when he should have been 
walking. Well, the angel of the Lord would keep the Egyptians back off the children of Israel long enough for the Israelites to get most of the way across the Red Sea. And God's people were distinguished from the heathen with light and darkness. That's Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 to 20. Moses held forth the rod of God and the Lord parted the waters for his poor, trapped and pathetic people to make their escape. Now, this was the greatest mass baptism in history. And yes, I have got a verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. While I'm turning there, also mention it was conducted at night. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud. Now what's a cloud made out of? And also passed through the sea. So they had water above them and on both sides. Sounds like a baptism. And it was, it says in verse 2. And were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat, all eat the same spiritual meat. I'll keep going because this is relevant a bit later. And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So, biggest baptism in history conducted at night. Uh, God kept the Egyptians close enough to Israel to entice Pharaoh and his army to enter the Red Sea. Now, could they see them? Maybe not. Maybe. I don't know. The angel of the Lord was getting in the way. So the Egyptians went into the Red Sea. Of course, the seabed's dry. So the chariots, they can move. The angel of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ and he comes across the water in the morning watch. The fourth watch, that is. Just like he did when he walked on the water to his disciples in Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. So what does it say? Verse 24 of Exodus 14. And it came to pass that in the morning watch... The Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels and they drove them heavily. Ever driven a car without wheels? What about a chariot? So that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone into that sea. <laughs> Maybe I would have, I don't know. We always think we wouldn't make the mistakes, don't we? Until we do. Quite literally, the wheels came off the Egyptian army. The Lord commanded Moses to stretch forth the rod of God once more, which he did, and the walls of water about the Egyptians collapsed and destroyed them all. That's Exodus chapter 14, uh, verses 26 to 28. The body of Pharaoh, that great conqueror, Amos the first, may never have been recovered. <coughs> what we do know is this. There's a memorial pyramid, and this is the last pyramid ever built for a pharaoh. Isn't that interesting? And that was constructed for him at Abydos in the Nile Delta, which is basically where he'd come from when he chased the Israelites. But he was never buried there. Now, the museum at Luxor in Egypt, this is the one that is the official Egyptian government museum, has a mummy which they think is the, should say the body, not the Boyd, of Amos I. And it was discovered with a cachet of royal mummies in the tomb of Penagem II at Deir el-Bari in 1881. So Deir el-Bari was an important uh, site, is an important site in Egyptian archaeology. And uh, they found this fellow's tomb and... Uh, as well as him being buried there, there was a, the mummies of a whole lot of very important pharaohs, well-known famous pharaohs. So it was a real find when, when they discovered this in 1881. So who was this guy? Pinagem II was a priest who became the ruler of Upper Egypt, so that's southern Egypt, during the time of King David. So a lot later than this, over 500 years later. He collected the royal mummies of previous rulers for their preservation and probably for legitimation purposes, because he wasn't a real pharaoh. He was a priest who just sort of, as, as uh, 
the dynasty collapsed. He was a strong man who took over. And uh, what makes you more legitimate than having uh, the bodies of previous great pharaohs already in your tomb while you're still alive? You know, the Egyptians spent years preparing the tombs. The, the preparation of a pharaoh's tomb took at least five years. The Luxor Museum has identified this particular mummy. So there's a mummy that was in there, in amongst all the other mummies, that they've identified as Amos I. With pretty reasonable uh, reasons. <laughs> reasonable reasons. Uh, his name was on the coffin and on the bandages. However, Pinagem II's name is also on those bandages. So obviously this mummy has been... I wouldn't say tampered with, but uh, probably renovated at this time in about 980 BC uh, because it had probably been damaged and so they patched it up. There was obviously some maintenance done on this mummy by Pinagem's physicians. Now what's interesting is that medical comparisons with mummies that were other known family members of Amos I seem to indicate this is not Amos the first at all. So they've compared other mummies, which they know who these people were, and they were close relatives of Amos the first, and uh, it doesn't match. So he may have stayed at the bottom of the Red Sea. We don't know. Certainly his firstborn, Amos Ankh, disappeared suddenly from the records at the end of Amos' reign. That is a well-known fact. So his firstborn son suddenly disappears. He's mentioned in the, the records all the way up to the end of the reign and then he's nowhere. Amos I was succeeded by another son, Amenhotep I, who ruled as a boy king under the regency of Amos' wife, Amos Nefertari. So whatever the fate of the body of Amos I, the events of the crossing of the Red Sea had a great effect on Israel. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Exodus chapter 14, verse 31. I just find it interesting that um, all of these coincidences occur at about this time in 1525 BC. You've got the death, the sudden mysterious death of a firstborn of uh, a pharaoh. You have a pharaoh that seems to have disappeared. Um, all these things come together. All right, Exodus 15. The Song of Moses. Well, is this the Song of Moses? Witnessing plagues on their enemies and experiencing divine deliverance are phenomenon which define the bookends of Israel's history before the millennium. At the start of their national history, we have plagues and deliverance and miracles and uh, great wonders. At the end of their history, the time of Jacob's trouble, I say history, but at the end of that history before the millennium, the time of Jacob's trouble, again, Great uh, tribulation, great um, affliction and persecution, people trying to wipe them out, um, and great deliverance. So, history rhymes. It began with the Exodus, it will end with the tribulation. Moses and the children of Israel sang a song on the shores of the Red Sea, and the content of that song is very interesting. You can read through it, we don't have time tonight. What you've got to keep in mind is the broader context. It's the first of a number of Israelite victory songs which reference a recent victory over a great foe, but these songs all extend into the realm of pr the prophetic future. So if you look, we will look at some of these other songs uh, in Judges and other places. And what you'll notice is some of the details in the victory song got nothing to do with what had just happened. So then we start to think, what's this about? They hint at the final victory over the enemy of Israel, the Antichrist. So the phrase, the horse and his rider, which turns up in verses 1 and 19, we can read verse 1 actually, and through to verse 3 I think. Uh, Exodus chapter 15 verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song, unto the Lord and spake saying I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea the Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation 
He is my God and I will prepare him in habitation. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. So the phrase the horse and his rider is quite striking. Uh, Jeremiah 51 verses nine, uh, 19 to 21 and Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 identify this phrase with the Antichrist, including his final defeat. So if you read Revelation chapter 6, the uh, rider on the white horse with the bow that goes forth to conquer, that is the Antichrist. It's one of the great afflictions of the tribulation period. And uh, Jeremiah 51 verses 19 to 21 also references him. Tribulation saints will sing a similar song in heaven, and that song is of Moses and of the Lamb, just before the final seven plagues are inflicted on the earth. I might just read that. That's Revelation 15, verse 3. It says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, that's in the millennium. For thy judgments are made manifest. And then we see that uh, straight after that, the last seven plagues. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 1 to 43 has another song of Moses and uh, the same theme is covered in verses 40 to 43. Let's read that. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. This is the Lord speaking. If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. The enemy, that's a phrase for the Antichrist. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. That's Moses prophesying at the end of uh, the song in Deuteronomy chapter 32. The theme is that God in his mercy brought forth the people which he had redeemed. That's what the rest of that song is about, the other 39 verses. All right, well, proving Israel. So God brought them out. What did he do? Did he just take them into Canaan? Did he just take them up to Sinai? Well, no, he's going to sort out what type of people these are before they get to Mount Sinai. So while, God was, uh, while Israel was God's chosen nation and while he just redeemed them from the cruel hand of the oppressor, the Lord needed to test out what sort of people these really were. And the experiences of the children of Israel between the Red Sea and Mount Sinai were a proving ground. You ever been in a situation where you're being tested and you didn't know it? And then you find out you've been tested and you're not sure how you went? It's a rather uncomfortable feeling for a couple of seconds. <laughs> this is Israel. The reaction of Israel in each instance would determine how God would deal with them in the future. Sadly, the Israelites proved themselves to be impatient and ungrateful, carnal complainers. Ooh, that's a bit close to home, isn't it? Is that not us? They murmured at the bitter waters of Marah. So they turn up to, they walk through the desert for a day or two, get to somewhere where there's water. Oh, can't drink this. What do they do? Do they pray? Do they talk to Moses nicely? No. They murmur, they complain, they accuse. Moses threw a tree into the water and it purified it. 
they shamelessly enjoyed the fruitfulness of Elam. So the next spot they go to is an oasis, beautiful water, paradise. Although they probably missed, so they didn't come to it and go, oh, God is good, look at this, we, were, we complained and yet look what he's provided. There's none of that humility, they just thought it was what they were entitled to, I guess. And they probably missed the significance of the number of palm trees. How many had gone into Egypt? How many palm trees were there? Israel had gone into Egypt as 70 souls and now they were a great multitude. They moved on, murmured again in the wilderness of, the wilderness of sin. Well, nothing good's going to happen there, is there? And so God, in, well, something good did happen. God instituted the manna, the bread from heaven, to supply them with their daily needs. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. What does manna mean, by the way? What is it? <laughs> Looking at it. What is this? Yeah. There was no water at Rephidim. So again, funny that, no water in a desert. Who would have thought? No water at Rephidim, so the Israelites repudiated their redemption. And once again, they said, why would you bring us out here? Take us back. Repudiated their redemption. And once again accused Moses of trying to kill them. At this place of striving, Masa and Meribah is how God described it. I should have put in the uh, meanings of those words, but I didn't. The Lord looked on from Mount Sinai as he directed Moses to strike the rock so that the water would come forth. That's in Exodus chapter 17, verses 3 to 7. Now, we've already read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, which identifies the rock as Christ. This is another type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the next test was an attack by Amalek, which saw the armies of Israel fight their first battle. Actually, they did quite well here. Why? Who's fighting for them? Joshua. What does Joshua mean? Jehovah saves, yeah. What, what other name means Jehovah saves in Greek? Jesus. All right, so Jesus fought for them. Hebrews makes that connection. Talks about Jesus in one of the verses early on in Hebrews and it's actually talking about Joshua. So it makes that connection for us. Uh, and they were victorious as Aaron and her helped Moses hold up the rod. You can see that in the picture there. And there's Moses striking the rock and the water came forth. He did it again another time when he got angry, but this was wrong. How many times was Christ smitten? Only once. So he broke the type. And as I said, God takes his type seriously so should we, Moses missed out on the promised land because he broke a type. Not because he murdered somebody, because he broke a type. Uh, defeating Amalek, God was revealed to Israel as Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. So when Israel wanted to win a battle, they had to have God on side. And what did God, what did God say? He said, I'm paraphrasing. If you're doing the right thing, one of you will chase a hundred. And you'll be invincible. If you're doing the wrong thing, one of them will chase a hundred of you. You won't be able to win anything. So it had nothing to do with their ability. It had everything to do with their relationship with the Lord. Following the battle, Moses' father will arise with Moses' wife and sons. Remember this one? The one that got cranky with him on the way to Egypt? The wife who bailed out on his way to the mission field. <laughs> the wife that couldn't get on with his sister. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jethro gave Moses some wisdom concerning delegating judgment of lesser cases. So Moses was hearing, Moses was the first judge of Israel, although he's not counted within uh, that bracket of leaders. He's his own special uh, category. But he was judging Israel, but he was judging everything. Major cases, minor cases. And so he was going to wear himself out. So Jethro said, delegate. Simple. And this became a practice which was instituted in the national life of Israel. So that whole 
uh, episode is in Exodus 18 verses 1 to 27. Interestingly, interestingly, the Levites often took on this role. The Levites were given a role judging. Finally, Israel journeyed until the nation was before the mount. So we're into Exodus 19. Verse 2 says, For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. Now, what happens here? Well, you're familiar with Exodus chapter 20, I'm sure, the Ten Commandments. What's actually going on? Is God just giving us some material to put onto um, black line masters so that kids can colour in Moses with the tablets in Sunday school? Or is there something a bit deeper going on? Well, this is the uh, bringing forth of a new dispensation. <coughs> and this dispensation... The law. Yeah. Actually, I've just realised I've missed one. I forgot promise. That was terrible. Anyway, you pencil that in there. The dispensations which we have covered so far have included innocence, the Garden of Eden, conscience from Eden, I should have said to Abraham. No, that's not right. Conscience from Eden to the flood, that was correct. And government from the flood to, that should be to Abraham, What's the uh, fourth dispensation? Promise. Okay. God is operating with the patriarchs under the dispensation of promise. The reason I realised that was because the law is the fifth dispensation. Because five is the biblical number of death. And uh, that's all the law will ever bring is death. So innocence, conscience, government, promise, now the fifth dispensation, law. So these dispensations or household arrangements were, first three anyway, were universal. All of mankind was under the same requirements and now the dispensation would only cover one nation. So the other nations of the earth would have to come to Israel to learn about righteousness and how to be at peace with God. And they did. Uh, the Queen of Sheba did that. And there were others too. Uh, it's one of the great rules of history that each dispensation ends in failure. And the dispensation which preceded the giving of the law had failed by this time as well. I uh, should have put in promise. So we'll talk about human government very quickly. Human government had been distorted and corrupted in just the same way as human conscience and human innocence. And so God brought forth the promises with the patriarchs. And then from the patriarchs, that really came apart in Egypt, didn't it? The rabble that leaves Egypt is pagan. They're heathen. They might be Israelites, but there's a lot wrong with them. So that uh, dispensation of promise, God operating a certain way with the patriarchs, that had come to an end. And uh, now the, I said fourth, it should be the fifth dispensation. And uh, the Bible scholars... Pretty much all accept this. Even those who oppose dispensationalism believe in the Old Testament, law, and the New Testament, grace. So they believe in two dispensations. They pretend they're not dispensationalists, but they are. We just, we just know there's more, that's all. But everyone believes, anyone that's a Bible believer believes in two dispensations. All right, the Ten Commandments. So we'll move through Exodus 19 and 20 very quickly and finish up there. Once Israel was camped before Mount Sinai, the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. How many times did Moses go up and down that mountain? It was a number of times. It wasn't just once. He then laid out the final destiny of Israel in a few verses. So this is Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 to 6. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountains, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, because of all that, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Which parable has a treasure in it? 
Treasure in the field. Well, there's your treasure. What's the field? The world. The treasure in the field is just Israel in the world. That one's easy. Ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. When will this happen? That's millennial. When they're all, they will all be priests in the millennium. And a holy nation, again, that's millennial too. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6. So Israel is the peculiar treasure, the treasure in the field, Matthew 13, verse 44. So the fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven is closely related to the future time when Israel obeys God's voice. At that time, Israel will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Over 3,500 years before this day of the Lord, the millennium begins, Israel stood before God as a newly formed nation. Isn't it interesting that God was already talking about something so far into the future? The Lord demanded cleansing and sanctification. You can read through Exodus 19, see those things. The mountain was off limits, death penalty. Moses was sent back down to command the Israelites and to impress on them the requirements of a holy God. Now, how did Israel respond? Wishful thinking. They thought they wanted to be a holy nation. And we could probably excuse them. They probably lied through ignorance. But what did they say? Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. What a bunch of liars. Liars. How long did it take before they'd made a golden calf? Yeah, what was the first, what was the first commandment? <coughs> when God appeared to them three days later as a great fire and earthquake upon Mount Sinai, the blast of a heavenly trumpet announced the arrival of Israel's king. So this is verses 7 to 25 of Exodus 19. The presence of the Holy One of Israel is a terrifying thing. You know, people pray for revival. You better watch what you pray for. It may not be much fun. A fact which quickly dawned on the children of Israel. As the Lord God of heaven and earth spoke with the voice of the ages, a voice which propelled the sound of thunder along with the bursting power of a mighty waterfall, through the bones of the Israelites, the children of Israel quaked in fear. They were crushed by the righteous statutes of the Almighty. They were awestruck by the sights and sounds which overwhelmed them. The Israelites fled and then begged Moses not to allow God to speak with them anymore. I think this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Exodus chapter 20 verse 19 says... And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. They're lying again. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. So the impact of God speaking to them physically was such that they thought they were going to die. The voice of a thrice holy God is terrifying to the ears of a fleshly sinner. The fiery law which issued forth, Deuteronomy 33 verse 2 talks about this being a fiery law, wounds the conscience and stokes the fires of hell in the hearts of men because they know that these judgments are true but they fail to keep them. Why does no one want to read the Ten Commandments anymore unless they're forgiven or they think they're keeping them? It's because you read them and you realise, I don't do that. And there's a, an eternal consequence. These Ten Commandments stand out as the quintessential standard of law and morality in human history. So they run from uh, Exodus chapter 20 verse 1 through to verse 17. They are universal precepts which echo through the ages. They are the bedrock of civilised society. As soon as we threw the Ten Commandments out of the schools, things started going downhill. Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments will not get you saved. The Ten Commandments will not get you to heaven, but they will direct you to the Saviour. 
They're like a schoolmaster that whacks you with a cane and directs you in the right direction. Keep doubling the words up. Direct direction. Anyway. Wow. And and we got we got rid of the schoolmaster. Yeah, that's right. First we got rid of the uh, first we got rid of the uh, Ten Commandments. Then we got rid of the cane, and now they're getting rid of the almost getting rid of the teachers, making us so powerless. These laws are the founding document of the nation of Israel. The themes are elementary. Like any kid can understand this. They're very profound. Man is to worship God and not the demon spirits hiding behind idols. That's the first commandment. Man is to reverence the name of the Lord. The seventh day is special, holy, revered. So under the law, this was the Sabbath. Under grace, uh, it's now Sunday, the Lord's Day. Doesn't mean we have to treat Sunday as a Sabbath, but people, Christians, should be in church on a Sunday morning and uh, just be aware that Sunday is a bit of a special day. The requirements are different under the law and under grace, but the principle of a day set aside for the Lord remains. Parents are to be honoured because this is appropriate. And it honours both the family and the Creator who instituted the family. The unrighteous killing of a fellow man was forbidden. A uh, man is made in God's image, so his blood is not to be shed like the blood of a beast. So if you're a farmer and you decide to kill an animal for meat or whatever, that's quite legitimate. But you can't just go and do that to a man. Uh, this does not take away the responsibility of human government to execute malefactors, but it does protect the righteous. Adultery is forbidden. Uh, this sin strikes at marriage, which is the basis of the family. Stealing is forbidden. Coveting is forbidden. Lusting after and even taking that which belongs to another is sinful and destructive to society. So in societies where generally there's a culture of honesty and decency and uh, not taking other people's stuff, uh, there's security, there's peace, and when those things go, when people don't worry about wanting what others have and just going and taking it, uh, we get all sorts of strife. Bearing false witness was also forbidden. This thing brings down the righteous and promotes the wicked. It's not the righteous that are going to go around and bear false witness to destroy other people, it's the wicked. Uh, the God who had redeemed Israel now spoke to his chosen nation. Now, they failed in that proving ground between the Red Sea and Mount Sinai and now they failed again. Children of Israel proved to be ungrateful and forgetful of the Lord's goodness to him. This really sets the tone for Jewish history throughout the ages. There's some notable exceptions, some wonderful time periods um, when Joshua was in charge, even around the wilderness. Spiritually one of the best times in Israel's history the wilderness wanderings. When David was king, uh, things were pretty good. But generally, the children of Israel have been ungrateful and forgetful of the Lord's goodness. Instead of acknowledging their complete inability to keep the law, they declared that they would keep it, even as they shrank in horror from it. So this combination of ingratitude, insincerity, and self-righteousness would plague Israel for millennia to come. It's the same problematic attitudes that the Lord Jesus had to deal with in his day. This generation would sabotage their own entry into the promised land. Instead, they would wander around the wilderness and die one by one in the desert over the next 40 years. So, Bible history is not always fun. Sometimes quite stark and sometimes quite uh, sad. But we need to learn the lessons. That's one of the points of studying history, isn't it? To learn the lessons. All right, let's uh, close in prayer and let's head on out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures and we thank you uh, for the Ten Commandments and for... 
uh, all that we can learn from the law and the way that it directs us in so many things, but especially to Christ and to salvation. Lord, I pray you bless us as we study your word and I pray that uh, these things that we've looked at tonight would uh, help us as we look to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 